thank you very much for the invitation and uh, the pos opportunity to give a quick like short lecture for such a wonderful audience uh, let me just know if uh, you can see my uh, cursor okay great okay so i think that uh, this talk would be will be rather elementary but still i hope that some of you will learn something new from this or at least will catch something interesting uh, so i'm mostly a physicist uh, but with some inclination towards mathematics so i will be talking a lot about uh, both of these uh, these fields and to begin with uh, we'll be talking about very various uh, things to begin with i would like to ask if you have seen diagram like this uh, in your life and so if anyone have seen it uh, just, yeah yeah, 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 of yeah of okay so there are people yeah, so uh, much time sorry so yeah. much time so much okay so many times okay okay so for people who haven't seen diagram like this this is a uh, a diagram that is often used uh, when one starts to learn elementary physics and is not yet very uh, good in uh, manipulating the algebraic expressions. This diagram uh, is a simple method of remembering the relations between velocity, distance and time in, uh, in a motion with constant velocity. And it works like this. If we are interested in a velocity, how about this relation between velocity and the other quantities in such motion, then we cross out the velocity, the V, and what we get is S, which is distance over the T, which is time. And we get the normal relation between these two, which everybody knows. And on the other hand, when we are interested in time, then we cross out T and we get S over V and indeed distance over uh, velocity gives gives us the time interval required to, to make this distance. And finally, if we are interested in distance that can be made in time T, then we cross out S and we get V times T. And this is a thing, a diagram that just uh, um, contains all these three expressions, but if someone knows how to manipulate the, the, these formulas uh, efficiently, it, something like this doesn't bring uh, too much, uh, like it is not very much needed. On the other hand, I guess more of you have seen diagrams like this, right? Yeah. So during chemistry classes, these are the proportions are pretty standard thing that one encounters, and it is usually a very simple way of thinking about them that for example here we have a substance which is silver chloride uh, and we can find using the periodic table that one mole of silver chloride uh, weighs 143 and a half grams and then if we are interested how uh, many moles how many how much silver chloride is in this amount of grams then we can use this simple uh, cross diagram and we can calculate that x equals this times this over this this gives us very simple memo memo technique of course one can just sit down and think about it a little bit and come up with this equation by themselves because it's pretty simple uh, relation but still often it is simpler to just know some simple diagram diagram techniques to perform such calculations and the other, and this is one of the, the uh, nice uh, things where diagram can come into that they can uh, very uh, quickly give us some, uh, like they can uh, simplify some calculations, or even we do not have to understand what's going behind the calculations, but we can still perform these calculations using these diagrams we have seen. On the other hand, we have also other diagrams that uh, let us. Uh, not only perform calculations, but let us present some things in a visual way. So everybody probably knows Venn diagrams, and they are very handy when one is learning uh, the uh, fundamentals of set theory. For example, here we have a, a very well-known and important uh, theorem in set theory that tells us that a product of sets and a sum of sets uh, can be decomposed in such a way. And 
one can, of course, uh, write it down as this formula, and then one can prove this formula, but it can be also presented in a nice visual way using such a Venn diagram. And here one can see that if we uh, if we mark uh, the, the, the part of this diagram that corresponds to the left-hand side, and if we mark the part that corresponds to the right-hand side, they, they give us exactly the same uh, shape here, suggesting that indeed they are equal. So diagrams also help us uh, like visualizing some things. And in fact, in physics and mathematics, uh, scientists are often using diagrams to simplify uh, different calculations or to visualize uh, some stuff. And I would like to uh, talk about it in the beginning of this lecture. And I will start with a short anecdote. Uh, when I was starting my under, undergraduate studies, my supervisor, who was an expert in the general relativity, told me that either I can learn uh, how to, uh, like I can learn general rel relativity properly. It means that I learn mathematics, which is involved in this field of physics, and this mathematics is differential geometry. It will take me three years to understand it. And after this time, maybe I will be able to calculate something and maybe start doing some research. Or the other way around, I can just learn the language. I can learn how to operate, how to manipulate the formulas in this field of physics and then do research almost immediately. But after the following, uh, in the following months, over the following years, I will learn what in fact uh, is in this theory, what, mathematic, uh, what mathematics uh, lies in this theory, behind this theory. Uh, and it is possible because from the physical point of view, general relativity uses a very nice notation that is shown here. And uh, this is type of notation that uh, lets one perform calculations without in fact knowing too much about the mathematical structures behind this notation. And behind and knowing too much about mathematical objects that are uh, represented by the, the, these symbols here, so one can just uh, know how to operate these symbols and then write down long lines like this and come after uh, several like lines of such calculations, come to some conclusion that makes sense, even though one doesn't really understand what's going on. It, it's very nice here because we have a notation that keeps track of all important things that, uh, that are relevant in our calculations. But one can see that this, uh, these calculations here look very complicated and they look like it's simple to get lost in them. Uh, for example, there are many indices, there are some uh, vertical lines in strange places, and it, one can easily imagine that it's simple to make some mistake here. So physicists also came up with an alternative approach to these calculations, which is called Penrose notation. And here uh, one can see exactly the same calculation that is done above using all these difficult symbols, but now with diagrams, with smaller number of diagrams, and with each diagram, uh, in some way different from the others, which uh, reduces the risk of making a mistake. And in fact, sometimes physicists, when working in general relativ relativity, are using such a diagrams to perform calculations. So it's also another nice uh, idea here. Uh, using diagrams here lets one uh, not only to perform some calculations uh, which are very difficult because of the involved mathematical structures, uh, because instead of working on these structures, we are just working on these diagrams and we are just uh, using, like we are, we are having some, some set of rules and that's all we need to understand. But also these diagrams uh, are so, so, so distinct that it's more difficult to make a mistake. Uh, but, but when speaking of diagrams, probably the most important uh, kind of diagrams that can be met in physics are Feynman diagrams. And I guess all of you have seen it at some point of your life. And uh, for example, here, is, here are several different various uh, Feynman diagrams. And these diagrams here represent uh, such a physical process where electron and uh, anti-electron uh, trans transform into uh, 
top quark, top anti quark, and uh, Higgs boson without any like it's not a lecture in particle physics so i just want to give an idea why these diagrams are so nice rather than go into details of particle physics uh, so the thing is that uh, we can imagine uh, such a process in such a way that okay we have an electron and uh, anti-electron and the, the uh, arrow here goes into this direction because it's an antiparticle, it's a convention. In fact, one can think about uh, the, the, this anti-electron as coming also in this direction. They collide with each other. They annihilate into either gamma, uh, which is a photon, or Z, which is a Z boson. And then this, uh, this particle uh, decays into uh, quark and anti-quark, and eventually this quark emits uh, Higgs boson, and this is exactly this, this kind of process we're talking about here. But this process can also take another uh, shape, because this bo Higgs boson may be emitted not by quark, but by anti-quark. But also this Higgs boson may be emitted by Z boson in, be, uh, in between these two uh, processes here. So there are many different ways in which this, uh, this kind of process can uh, take place. And in fact, there is an infinite number of such uh, ways. And if one wants to calculate uh, properly any physical observable, behind this process, one needs to take into account as many ways of, uh, as many ways of, uh, we, in which this process can take place as possible. So one has to draw down as many diagrams as is possible, show this process, and then perform some calculations. And why it's so important? Let's see a simpler, uh, a simpler uh, case. Here we have an operation where uh, electron and a uh, process where electron and anti-electron annihilate into photon, and then this photon uh, decays into muon and antimion. And uh, in fact, this picture uh, can be converted into something which is called an amplitude. And amplitudes are a fundamental objects in particle physics because they let us calculate observables regarding the given process. And in fact, each part of this picture is reflected in some part of this formula. So for example, this arrow here is represented by this U here. Then this arrow here is represented by this V bar here. And this place of um, annihilation is this place here with I, E, gamma. And then, for example, this uh, wiggly line, which is called propagator, is represented by this part here, and et cetera, et cetera. Each part of this uh, diagram has some mathematical formula behind it. And now, uh, without Feynman diagrams, if we want, would like to calculate anything in particle physics, we would have to write down this kind of formula for every possible way uh, of this process taking place. So we would have to write down the formula for this, uh, like, uh, for process like this, for process like this, like this, and lots and lots of other processes. And it may be very difficult without any visual aid. So it's much simpler instead of, uh, working with this with this formulas here it's much simpler to just draw a bunch of diagrams like here and think about it visually with diagrams and then translate these diagrams into these formulas and then using these formulas one can calculate anything uh, they want so it's a very helpful uh, tool in physics okay and uh, to end this this first part regarding the, the tools that physicists and mathematicians are using in their work, uh, which are diagrams, uh, I would like to present two more strange, or oh, strange, uh, funny kinds of diagrams. One of them is a Young diagram, uh, which uh, for mathematicians is uh, one of central objects in so-called representation theory, while for physicists it's a very important thing in quantum mechanics. And it is connected with, uh, like the, these two things are connected with uh, them, uh, with yeah, uh, with each other. Uh, the thing is that one can, yeah, yeah, that young diagrams are these strange box diagrams, and in uh, representation theory they let one, uh, one may prove uh, representation, like sorry, one may use representation theory to prove that they give 
uh, some knowledge about some representations of some groups without going into details. But for physicists, physicists usually don't know anything about the presentation theory. They are taking for mathematics just the uh, just the tool, which is the Young diagram, and physicist, when has proper uh, background in quantum mechanics, can see this diagram and already just seeing these boxes, he can tell. They can tell that oh, this diagram uh, describes that if we have three electrons and we combine them into a system, then this system uh, can either be uh, uh, can either have spin one half and it can be realized in two ways since doublet and uh, or it can have spin three half and then it can be realized in four ways as a quartet and all this knowledge is conveyed in this strange box diagram but and uh, yeah so that that's a funny thing that one can use this visual aids to get so uh, so much information and on the other hand in uh, general relativity there are very uh, important and useful types of diagrams which are called Pernod's diagrams uh, in which one tries to uh, present the whole space time or the region of space time in which one is interested in a compact way in which uh, the, the, the causal structure of the space time can be understood well, and this is a very good uh, way of doing it. So, just to sum up this part, uh, scientists often use different diagrams and diag diagrammatic techniques to simplify the calculations. And diagrams not only can make calculations easier, but also sometimes uh, no, the uh, sole knowledge of how to use diagrams can uh, let us perform calculations without understanding the mathematics behind them. But also diagrams allow sometimes to see the similarities and differences between different objects be because it's simpler to see differences between uh, different uh, images, different pictures than from different formulas, for example. Okay, so that's to finish the first part. And now I would like to talk about some more, uh, like not so academic stuff, but some more uh, connected to a school cu curriculum, probably. And uh, I would like to ask you, what is symmetry? How would you define such a, uh, such a term as symmetry? Okay, uh, yeah, Polly raised hand. Okay. It's uh, something where um, uh, something repeats. Uh, so, like uh, we have the same thing and that repeats uh, uh, one sometimes, so like or two times, and that will be half symmetry, and or a lot of times, but uh, like in uh, Row, so that will be uh, another symmetry. Okay, so yeah, in, in some way something repeats. Uh, that's true. Dennis, you also have some idea? Uh, as a function from one point uh, to another point. As a function. Uh, okay. Uh, Sergi, uh, another idea? Um, yeah, it's uh, like some points that uh, mirror on an, on a line. Mm -hmm. so okay. Mirroring. Okay. Uh, so uh, different ideas, although m most of them. Oh, Sofia. Okay. So that's the, the last one, Sofia. So it's like uh, being proportionally similarly to the other part. Okay. In some ways, it's proportionally or in some ways similar to other part. Okay, many ideas, and I can see that most of them come from geometry, and I would guess so because symmetries are in school mostly encountered in geometry classes. But I would say that in most general uh, viewpoint, uh, symmetry is a property of any system. And this property tells us that this system does not change under some transformation. So uh, as an example, uh, we can have this shape and we can, of course, we have this uh, symmetry that we can uh, reflect it along some axis and the shape doesn't change. And also we can rotate it 
but only rotated uh, by some fixed angles and also this shape this shape doesn't change so this sh shape has some symmetries we have also the other shape which is just a uh, circle and it has even more symmetries because we can rotate it by any angle and it doesn't change so these are symmetries that are very well known from the geometry, but it is much more general idea. For example, we can say that this world has a symmetry and does anyone have an idea what kind of symmetry it is? Yeah, Daniel? Uh, if we will read it from the end to the beginning, we will get the same word. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, this this is a word which doesn't change under some transformation, and this transformation is to read this word backwards. And of course, not every word has this property, so it's pretty special here. And such symmetries can be encountered in many uh, places in physics and mathematics. And I understand that most of you uh, have seen them in uh, geometry and. Uh, I would guess that me not being a fan of geometry during my high school times, uh, you probably know much more about the uh, about the applications of symmetries in various geometrical problems. So I would like to focus here on some uh, other uh, ideas behind the symmetries. I think that maybe I'll skip this part here. And instead, let's go. Are there, uh, in, in our audience today, are there any participants of uh, Astronomy Olympiads? That's my question. Not really. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, case, uh, it is, it's nice because it's new for all of you, probably. Uh, you probably know from geometry lessons uh, sine and cosine law, which relates in a triangle. Uh, it, it, it gives just relation between angles and edges of a triangle. And it turns out that uh, these two kinds of formulas have uh, its, uh, its exact versions in something which is called spherical triangles. And what are spherical triangles? Well, they are triangles on a sphere, but uh, since sphere is curved, uh, of course, edges of these triangles are not made uh, from the parts of the line, but instead they are arches of great circles. Great circles, which are the, the biggest circles in, uh, in the sphere. Uh, so as an example here, we have uh, such a spherical triangle. And it has three edges, which are uh, which are measured by the angles small a, small b, and small c. This red dot is the center of the sphere, and it also has uh, four vertices with angles capital A, capital B, and capital C. And uh, when one is um, interested in astronomy and one would like to calculate anything regarding the position of objects on the celestial sphere, it is very important to know how to uh, perform calculations involving such spherical triangles. And most of formulas in, in this uh, field of astronomy just relies on two formulas which are written here, and which are the cosine law and sine law. And I would like to present a very short derivation of these two laws because they give us uh, very nice ideas connected with symmetries. So let's start with the first of them, uh, which is the cosine law. We would like to uh, find this relation. Uh, we like to, to uh, derive this relation from this picture. So we are interested in cosine of uh, angle A, which is here. Let us say that, for uh, just for the simplicity, that this sphere is a unit sphere, but by which I mean that the radius of this sphere is equal to one. Okay, so we know uh, that uh, cosine of A, uh, cosine of an angle, uh, is related to the vectors be uh, between which this, this angle is by the um, scalar uh, product. So if we have a vector, uh, let us say this red dot is O. If we have a vector OB, 
and the vector OC, if we take scalar product of them, it's norm of OB times norm of OC times cosine of A. But since this is a unit sphere, norm of OB and OC is equal to one. So we just get the following simple uh, formula. So now, if you want to derive this equation, all we need to do is just calculate OB times OC. And how to do it? In general, it may be complicated, but we can simplify our life by introducing uh, the coordinate system in a very particular way, in a way in which OB and OC will be very simple vectors. So how we do it? How do we do it? So we introduce the coordinate system that is centered in this red dot and with Z axis going through A. So Z axis goes like this. And then also we choose X axis in such a way that this uh, two vectors OA and OB lay in a plane XZ. It can be seen here. We have OB and OA laying in a plane ZX. And why do we want this coordinate system to be like this? Because then uh, the vector OB here can be very quickly found out that uh, X uh, coordinate of this vector is just length of it, which is one times sine of C. So it's just sine C. Then Y uh, coordinate doesn't exist because this whole OB vector lays uh, on a plane X, Z. And finally, the Z uh, coordinate is just cosine of this angle C. And in a similar way, but a little bit more complicated, OC can be found because let's start with the last coordinate. Obviously, similarly, if, as for uh, this OB, for OC, it will be cosine of B. But then uh, this X and Y coordinates will be sine of B, but multiplied by cosine of A or by sine of A, depending on whether we are interested in X or Y coordinate. And then we just multiply these two uh, vectors uh, just make a scalar product of them. And we can see that we get sine C times sine B times cosine capital A, which is this part. Uh, this middle gives us zero. And finally, cosine C times cosine B, which is this part. And as a, a result, we were able to very quickly uh, derive this very important theorem. Okay, and how about the second one, the sine law? Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, to uh, emphasize here: uh, this calculation was very simple because we have used a symmetry here, which was the rotational symmetry. It means that we could uh, rotate the coordinate system in any way. Uh, the z-axis could go through any point of the sphere, so we could choose it in such a way that it is uh, very convenient for us. And we didn't lose anything, like there is no loss of generality in this uh, approach because this problem has this, uh, this rotational symmetry. And here, uh, to derive the second uh, relation, we'll use the other type of symmetry. Uh, in fact, we will just uh, use some uh, simple uh, algebraic uh, manipulation. So let us start with sine squared of capital A. Of course, we can write it as one minus cosine squared of capital A. And then, uh, and then we can use the knowledge that we already have regarding this cosine of capital A, because we have already uh, derived the uh, cosine law. So we can just plug this whole formula here. And then we just uh, make all this, uh, the, the, this whole expression into a single fraction. We have used here the, the, the fact that uh, again, sine squared B can be written as one minus cosine squared B and sine squared C can be written as one minus cosine squared C. 
and this part just gets is the same as before. So we have the following equality. And then this expression here can be uh, just evaluated. So here we get one minus cosinus square B minus cosinus square C plus cosinus square B cosinus square C. But the, the this cosine square B cosine square C is exactly the same thing that appears here because of this uh, square here. So it gets uh, cancelled out. And from here, we get uh, cosine square A and two cosine A cosine B cosine C. So exactly what we can see inside this uh, square bracket here. And if we take now uh, the root, uh, the square root of, uh, out of both of the sides of this equality, then here we have one over two. And also, if we uh, divide everything by uh, sine A, we get the following formula. So uh, does anyone see something interesting regarding the right-hand side of this formula? This complicated, it looks complicated, but it has a very nice symmetry in a way. Can you see it? Yes, Shikan? Yeah, it's symmetric. Yeah, in it's AB symmetric, AB. but what does it mean it's symmetric? If you per permute the variables A, B, and C, it stays the same. Exactly. Exactly. If you permute A, B, and C in any way, you get exactly the same, uh, exactly the same formula. It means that if we had started with sine capital B here, we would arrive in exactly the same formula. So it means that uh, this, this, and this are equal to the same formula, and it leads us to the conclusion that they are equal to themselves. So this way you have proven uh, the very uh, nice theorem, which is the sine law for uh, spherical uh, triangles. Okay, so these were um, examples from mathematics. Now let's see some simple example from physics. And this is a very, like, it's a very basic example, but uh, it's a nice one because sometimes in physics, one uses the word that, okay, something is impossible because of the symmetry. And usually people do not elaborate further what does it mean. So let's see what it can mean in a very explicit way. So let's say we have a cylinder, uh, an infinite cylinder, uh, which is charged uh, with a negative charge. And in the very middle of this infinite cylinder, we put a small positive uh, particle. And we would like to ask in which direction the force uh, will uh, act on this particle. So any ideas? Yeah, it's a very simple question. <laughs> Let's see the chat. Okay, that, it won't move, there will be no fault. Yeah, exactly, that's true. And one can see, say that's because of the symmetry. So let's see uh, how the symmetry uh, argument works here. Let's copy this picture. And let's assume that there is some force in some direction. Let us say this, that this force is in this direction here. Okay. So uh, it means, let us copy this picture once again. Okay, so we have exactly the same picture, the same direction, everything agrees. And now let's uh, rotate this picture here. Oh, and we have seen that we have exactly the same system the same physical situation, but in this situation, the force is uh, directed in this direction, while in this uh, situation, the force is directed in this direction. So even we have the same situation, but the force is directed in two different directions, which gives us a contradiction. So that's where the symmetry uh, comes in, at the place where we were able to uh, to rotate our system, to obtain the system that looks exactly uh, the same as the initial one. And this uh, idea can be, of course, used for any other direction of this arrow and leading to a conclusion you have already known that there is absolutely no force. So that's nice. And symmetries are very helpful in many problems, but not always there are something, but sometimes they may be misleading. And here is the uh, simple um, example. Let us uh, assume that we have four cities that are uh, placed in vertices of such a square. 
and miles of the cities would like to connect all of them with roads, but in a such a way that uh, these roads are as, as short as possible. And of course, this problem is very symmetric. So one would guess that, okay, maybe let's connect this in such a way. It's very symmetric way. So we guess it's a good solution to this question. And it turns out that in such case, the uh, sum of these distances is two uh, square roots of two. But it turns out that it's not the optimal solution. And the optimal solution looks rather like this. And one can calculate that indeed for such a, a network of roads, it is the, the, the sum of distances. And uh, what we have seen, what we see here is that the solution to our problem is not as symmetric as our problem. So if we in the very beginning said that, oh, this problem has a symmetry, so the solution also has the symmetry, it would lead us to this diagonal uh, version. It turns out that it's not necessarily true. And in fact, in physics, uh, there is a term for such a phenomena, which is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. It was very popular several years ago during the uh, Higgs boson craze. And it just means, it's a very complicated term that just means that the solution uh, of this problem has less symmetry than the problem. And here it's the case because the problem has more, uh, uh, like the problem has, uh, for example, the symmetry that it can be, uh, um, it can be reflected along the diagonal while the solution cannot. Right, right, yeah, okay. Okay, so to sum this, uh, this part up, symmetries, uh, can greatly simplify many problems, looking like finding out the symmetries. And sometimes even uh, problems are very complicated without symmetries or even unsolvable. For example, in this case, when we were talking about uh, this electric force, if this uh, particle wasn't in the very middle of this, uh, of this um, cylindrical um, shape, then it would be diffi more difficult to calculate the uh, electric force. You would need to perform some involved calculations. But since it was in the very middle, it was very simple. Okay, and I guess uh, we could make a short break because it's a uh, half of the talk, I would say. Right, my Michel? Uh, very good. Uh... Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, please paste paste away into the chat. Yes, there are some there are some questions. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, okay, so let's start. Uh, so the first question: What is the value of a plus b plus plus c? It's a great question. Uh, let's go back to this picture here. Not here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, it's it's uh, larger than pi. It's larger than uh, 180 degrees. And in fact, one can see uh, it very simply uh, just by looking uh, at the triangle. Let us imagine that this is the uh, this is the Earth, and we have a triangle with one uh, vertex vertex at the uh, north pole, uh, one vertex at the uh, going along the uh, Greenwich uh, line uh, down to equator, and then one uh, at the 90 degrees uh, east, and each A, capital A, capital B, and capital C angles then will have 90 uh, degrees. So the sum of these angles will be uh, 270 degrees. And even more, there is a very nice uh, formula uh, that uh, gives a correspondence between the area of a triangle of a spherical triangle and the sum of its uh, of its uh, inner uh, angles and it tells that the bigger the area is the bigger the sum of a b and c is that's a very good question uh, this diagram the pairwise distances are not all the same in which diagram uh, because there's been, uh, give me a second. Ah, I see, in the four points. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, these are in, uh, in uh, um, vertices of, uh, of a square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So uh, are not all the same. Here we have square root of two. Yeah. Okay, great. So if there are any other questions, you can also ask. Ah. <laughs> uh, okay, question about the positive charge sended by a negative charge ring. Uh, it seems that there was a paradox which stated that in the right such an equilibrium is impossible. Uh, well, it's, uh, I would like, it depends what are you uh, talking about, because uh, if you are talking about this kind of, just this kind of um, system that was presented there, it would be in fact equilibrium, but it would be unstable. But uh, by which I mean that if you would like to realize it physically, you would have to put it uh, this uh, point charge in the very center of this uh, system, because any slight uh, deviation from the symmetry would uh, in, uh, immediately lead to uh, existing force and to, to the particle going, getting closer to the uh, to the walls in some direction. But you may be talking about some other stuff like I don't know. It's Adam first. No, someone's theorem about uh, existence of uh, of. Uh, systems of point particles uh, with electric force that, that do not exist stable system like this, but it goes way beyond what I'm talking about here. Ah, okay, it's practically impossible. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. It's practically impossible. Okay, and the other question was about nine cities instead of four. Uh, no problem. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> to be honest, I know this. Uh, this example as uh, some kind of uh, small interesting fact from uh, International Physics Olympiad, I think, in Estonia. Uh, they just were like without any uh, more uh, inside knowledge about it, it was just presented there. I don't know how it. Oh, okay, I see that it's some nice. Uh, reference Steiner tree problem. Ah, okay, with uh, various uh, generalization. Great, I, I'd love to, to read about it more after. Uh, is spontaneous symmetry breaking something that happens often in problems? It depends. Uh, it depends uh, on. Mm, in physics, it it happens sometime, but usually one knows uh, when it takes place, and usually it is very helpful. But uh, just the, the important thing here is that the sole fact that the system you are uh, investigating is symmetric doesn't tell us anything about the symmetries of its solution. And okay, indeed, it happens very oftenly that. Uh, that uh, spherical, uh, sorry, symmetrical systems have non-symmetric solutions, but also sometimes one can prove for some specific cases that if the system has some symmetry, then the solution also has to share this symmetry. And these results are usually very nice because they can greatly simplify. Because when you are starting to investigate some problem, it is often a very good idea to start investigate not the most general solution, not to start looking for the most general solution, but to look for a solution which has some symmetries and maybe you will be able to find some ideas there. And if someone is able to show that all the solutions need to have these symmetries, then it's a great thing because you can just uh, from the very beginning only focus on the symmetrical solutions. Okay. Ah, uh, could you explain why the symmetry breaks when we talk about electricity in semiconductors? The structure seems to be pretty symmetrical, yet only some electrons leave their places. Uh, no, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I can't explain. I, 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 I'm not a specialist in, in uh, condensed matter physics, so I'm very sorry, but I uh, don't think I will be able to talk about it. Uh, Although, ah, you're talking about semiconductors. Sorry, I thought about uh, superconductors. Semiconductors. Mm. 
No, I, 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 I don't think I can do it just, uh, you know, out of uh, my head. So I'm sorry. Um, maybe David uh, and uh, can stay in touch with Philip uh, and we'll figure <laughs> out the reference for you. Of course. Uh, let me suggest that we move on with uh, the lecture now and okay. uh, uh, keep the open questions for later. Great. Okay, so now I would like to talk a few minutes about something which is called Fermi problems. And uh, probably one of the most examples of Fermi problems is uh, an old question that according to the legend Fermi asked one time and it was how many piano tuners, uh, tuners are there in Chicago and the idea behind Fermi problems is that sometimes like we see problems like problem like this and we may just don't know what is the answer to this problem right and it may seem that there is absolutely no way of getting the, the, this answer out of thin air but sometimes it is possible uh, just by making some estimations to answer questions like this. It is also sometimes called the back of an envelope calculations. And in, in, the, in the internet, you can find lots and lots of examples uh, writing down either Fermi problems or back of the envelope calculations uh, of such problems. And here I would like to focus on a few simple ones because you don't have much time. So does anyone know how many seconds are there in a year? Does anyone know just out of their head what's the solution to this question? Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, that, great. Uh, but assume that we don't know it. Yeah, of, of course, it's also, that's true that it depends. It's all the great estimation. It's for sure more than 3,600. Okay, uh, so one can just try to very quickly calculate it because what do we know? Okay, as one said, uh, more than 3,600, 3, that's true. So uh, there are 3,600 uh, seconds in an hour. In a day, there are 24 hours. So let's multiply one uh, by the other. It's complicated, so no, okay, it's not very complicated, but instead of multiplying 3,600 times 24, we can just multiply uh, 3,000 times uh, 30, because it's much, uh, much simpler, and we are uh, underestimating uh, one thing, overestimating the other thing, maybe it will somehow cancel out. Okay, so 3,000 times 30 is uh, 9, hundred thousand yeah, no three sorry three thousand times thirty it's uh, ninety uh, thousand right if I'm correct and now all uh, ninety thousand is very close to uh, one hundred thousand so we can estimate it so we have one hundred thousand seconds in a day more or less so then we can just multiply it by a number of days in a year and we get something close to uh, three hundred fifty times one hundred thousand. Uh, so it's uh, three, uh, yeah, so it's uh, 35 uh, million seconds. And in fact, it is very close uh, to the, to the uh, number that Vlad have gave us before and the number written here. So we are able to get this number without performing very um, precise calculations, but just by estimating something sometimes up, sometimes down. Okay, it was rather silly example, so let's find something more complicated. How, what do you think? How fast does hair grow on your heads? Any uh, bets on it? People are, okay. Okay, uh, Kirill, Kirillenko? Uh, to my see, hello, I think it's 50 centimeters per year. 15 centimeters per year. Okay. Okay. And yeah. Oh, 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 oh okay. It's, uh, someone found, yeah, of course, it depends on a person. Uh, someone uh, writes down five centimeters a two month, someone two centimeters a month, and someone else, uh, how often do I go for a haircut? Yeah, exactly. So uh, how of, so th that's a question. How often do you go to a, for a haircut? And how, um, what is the difference in your hair length between before and after this haircut. So uh, does anyone recall? 
for example, how how often do you go for the haircut and what is the difference? Yeah, Polly. So I cut my hair every month and it's like two, three centimeters usually. Okay, and every month, right? Uh, hair coloring and it was also like uh, two centimeters I see. a month. Okay, okay. So it, it two so two centimeters every month would give us twenty four centimeters a year. Now we have, for example, another person who tells us that four centimeter every two months, which gives us uh, four times six, is also yeah twenty four centimeters per year. Uh, here is uh, similar yeah. Uh, so of course it depends on the person. Usually it is said that it's like fifteen centimeters per year as as uh, someone told us before uh, but uh, we can get a very nice a very quick estimation of the order of magnitude this way because if someone asked just out of thin air how fast does hair grow it may be difficult to say is it like millimeter or is it like a meter per year so here we have a very nice estimation of the order of magnitude okay another question so well, it's just a simple one. How many times would a human chain of all people encircle the Earth? Uh, would it be at least one or more than one? So any estimations? Sorry, what can means? I forgot this word. Oh, it's a question uh, here. Human width is a quarter of human height. Well, it's up to you. We are interested in some estimation. We don't need to have this number up to the uh, very uh, big precision. Okay, so there's some question. Yeah, a couple of times. Okay, uh, 250. So we have already some different. Oh, one and a half. We have very. <laughs> here we have a very large number okay so it's very nice because there are uh, very different answers so let's try to, to calculate it quickly so there are eight more or less eight billion people's uh, people's eight, eight billion people in the earth and just to, to have a simple answer let us say that if people person is standing it takes one meter of space so then, since uh, the equator has 40,000 uh, uh, kilometers, if we, uh, if I'm not mistaken, if we divide one by the other, we get 200. Okay, yeah, exactly, exactly. And yeah, it's what I have written here. Of course, it is just an estimation because the, the correct value doesn't exist because never people have form a human chain and it will be impossible to the oceans but still it's a nice estimation and the last question a more practical how many songs can be put into one gigabyte of space one uh, so some people may know it from uh, the experience but it's also simple to calculate it okay so several hundreds and yeah, indeed, uh, when one was when uh, one is converting a song into MP3 file, it can be seen that usually uh, the bitrate that is used is something between 100 and 300 uh, kilobits per second. So we can take 200, for example, as a value in the middle. So if we have 200 kilobits per second. We have to divide it by eight to get kilobytes. So we have 25 kilobytes per second. Uh, so now uh, let us say that uh, song, like, like song is for, takes four minutes, mm -hmm. for example. So it's four minutes times 60 seconds. It gives us uh, 600, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so 6,000, 6,000 uh, kilobytes, so six megabytes. Uh, per song so it's more or less five megabytes per song as yeah as Brad has found out more or less five megabytes per song uh, and so it gives us more or less 500 songs yeah I have here 550 because I guess I was using some other numbers when I was calculating it earlier so yeah these are very simple calculations that usually lead us to a very close 
uh, number, to the number which is very close to the true. And how does it work? Why can we just sometimes uh, take a larger number, sometimes a smaller number, and in some way hope that in the end it will uh, work out? So to uh, understand it better, we have to talk for a moment about something which is called random walk and uh, about some very simple, specific realization of random walk. And what is random walk? So imagine that you are standing uh, on a numbered line at zero and you are flipping a coin. And for one outcome, you are going uh, right uh, to plus one. And for the other outcome of the flip, you are going left to minus one. And then you are repeating this, uh, this um, process uh, as long as you want. So after the first flip, there is a one half chance you are here and one half chance you are here. Then after the second flip, there is 25% chance that you are at point two, 25% that you are at point minus two and one half chance you are at point zero. And here are real, some uh, examples of some realizations of such process where we have 100 uh, flip coins. And one can see that uh, different things can happen. One can go pretty far away from uh, the center, but one can also uh, come back to the neighborhood of the center. So now there are two important questions that we may ask. So the first question is, so what is the, uh like imagine that we have made like 1000 different uh processes like this so we have 1000 plots like this here and we are asking what is the average uh place uh where one uh, stands after 100 flips so where on average one will be so any ideas exactly zero and do you have some simple uh, proof of this fact or some argument for this? Oh, 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 exactly, symmetry, exactly. There is absolutely no difference between going left and going right. So uh, if the answer was two, then the answer also should be minus two. So as a result, the only uh, reasonable answer is zero. Okay, although, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, and the second more complicated question is, okay, but what is not the average position, but the average distance from zero? Because distance is not a negative number. So there is no symmetry now. And it is a little more complicated, uh, And but it can be calculated pretty easily because assume that at some point you are at, uh, the distance x n uh, uh, yeah uh, we are you are uh, after n flips you are at the distance x n and then uh, when you flip then you either go to the uh, go, go more to the right or go more to the left so you can either have uh, your new distance will either be x n plus one or x n minus one. Uh, and here, what we are calculating instead of uh, the absolute value, uh, which is more difficult, we are just calculating a square uh, of the distance. So uh, then if we take a square root, we get absolute value. Okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, there is a chance one half that you will be at xn plus one and chance one half you will be at xn minus one. Uh, so you have to uh, take a square of these two numbers. And if you calculate it, uh, what you get is just this simple expression. So it means that the uh, square of uh, the distance increases after the, the, uh, each, like, uh, sorry, that on average square of the distance increases after each uh, flip. And that's exactly what is uh, said here. The average distance from zero after n steps is well after taking a square root, square root of n, and it's a pretty simple calculation from uh, yeah from, from the, the theory of random walks. And why do we even uh, new? Uh, why do we even uh, need all this information? Because let's go back to our Fermi problems and to the question: Why uh, do answer uh, we are getting so uh, close uh, to, to the real values? 
And to understand it, let us assume for simplification that uh, at each step, when we are estimating something in our Fermi problem, uh, we either overestimate the, the, the actual value or underestimate by the factor of k. So it means that initially we either uh, overestimate by k or underestimate by k. So uh, our value is uh, larger by the factor of k than actual one or smaller by the factor of k than the actual one. And then after the next uh, iteration, after the, the next step, also our value again is either overestimated or underestimated. So it may go to k square, uh, or we may go to the actual good value, or our value may be k, uh, may be too small k squared times. And uh, can you see here that it's in fact something very similar to the random walk, because at each step, we are just going either uh, in that one direction or the other direction. Of course, here we are multiplying, while for the random walk, uh, it was just adding or subtracting, but do you have do you know how to we how can we change multiplication into addition? Any ideas? Oh yeah, exactly. Logarithm. Yeah, it's just a random uh, walk after taking the logarithm. So indeed, here we have log k minus log k. Here we'll have two log k zero minus two log k, etc., etc. So uh, on average, after uh, n estimates, since the average distance is, as we have told, uh, square root of n, here the average distance will be square root of n times log k. And if we again take an exponent of it, because we have logarithmic, so now we have to go back, we get just k to the square root of n. So it means, for example, that if in each step we uh, make uh, overestimation or underestimation by the factor of maximally three, and we make four steps, we make four estimations, then uh, in maximally, uh, the, the, like, sorry, on average, we are wrong by the factor of nine because it's three to the power of square root of four, which is three to the power of two, which is nine. So we are getting close regarding the order of the magnitude. And that's the uh, somehow like heuristic, but still it's some explanation behind this Fermi uh, problems. And how does it work that we can estimate and we get uh, the, the, this, uh, this results that so well. So to sum up this part, uh, when you are only interested in the order of magnitude of the result, we can afford to make quite rough estim estimations because all underestimations and overestimations tend to cancel each other out to some degree, as we have seen. Okay, so now let's talk uh, for a moment about dimensional analysis, which is how to solve physical problems without knowing anything about physics or almost anything about physics or other how to do this without knowing the precise physical mechanisms. And the most popular uh, illustration of the power of dimensional analysis is the so-called problem of a mathematical pendulum, which is just the problem of uh, some point mass on a rope. And we are interested in the pendulum consisting, consisting of these two uh, parts, and we are interested in a period of such a pendulum. So having uh, such a problem, of course, one can write down the equations coming from the Newton laws of mechanics, mechanics and then one can just uh, derive uh, the, the proper uh, formula. But this formula, in fact, can be almost guessed. And how to do it? So let's try to collect all the quantities that may be relevant in this problem. So for sure, we know that mass of this, uh, of this uh, ball here may be relevant, but mass of the ceiling probably is not relevant. We also can say that, okay, probably the length of this rope is relevant, but probably the material of which this, length, uh, this rope is uh, made, it doesn't ma uh, matter too much. 
We also know that, okay, probably the gravity is an important force here. So because without gravity, we can imagine that the pendulum wouldn't work. So we also would guess that something with the, the uh, gravitation, gravitational acceleration uh, may uh, take place here in, in our equations. So we can collect, and of course, uh, also if you are talking about the, uh, the period of these oscillations, it probably is uh, important to, to uh, know what is the initial angle, because why not? One would expect that the larger the angle is, that the larger the period is, or something like this. So let us let us collect all these uh, all these relevant uh, quantities in this, this box, and we can see that uh, all of this quantity has some very well defined uh, units in SI system. And what we would like to do is to somehow combine them into such a combination that would give us a period. So. We, to get a formula out of this uh, out of these quantities that gives us time, uh, we need to for sure get uh, have this g because g is the only quantity that has seconds in uh, in its units. But we also can see that kilograms, the mass, is only in m. So if our formula uh, contained mass. It would uh, the, the result uh, we are getting would be with kilograms. Since we want the result with seconds, uh, it cannot contain mass because there is nothing else that would cancel these kilograms. And this basic uh, this basic reasoning tells us that okay, so we want also to get rid of meters because we want just seconds. So let us take L over G, then meters will cancel and we'll get seconds squared, but then we can take square root and that's something that has the uh, the units of time, seconds. But still there is a problem of this angle here, that angle is dimensionless. So we have no idea, uh, we, we have no uh, reason for excluding this, but still uh, we obtain a nice, uh, a nice equation that can be tested uh, in an experiment. And for example, we can take, uh, in an experiment, we can take uh, ropes of different lengths, and we can see that in fact, the pe period scales as a square root of the length of the rope. So this formula works very well. But then we can also uh, try to do experiments with different angles, different initial angles. And then it turns out that for small angles, there is no dependence on this phi. So the, this function f looks like a constant function. And to understand it better, one would need to probably solve this problem properly. And it turns out it's not a simple thing to, to show that uh, this function f, in fact, has the following, uh, following shape, where k is a very special mathematical function called a complete elliptic integral. It is not important. The important thing is that if we plot this function, it looks like this. And we can see that for small angles close to zero, it is almost flat. And it is close to 2 pi. So this is exactly where it comes from. And the larger this angle is, the uh, larger the deviation of the, uh, of this this plot from the constant function is so but for small function uh, for small angles it is okay so that's a simple simple uh, and very well known derivation like maybe not derivation but uh, way of getting the, the uh, period of the pendulum and as a second uh, more interesting maybe example uh, we would like to uh, in some way uh, estimate what is the uh, what is the, the order of magnitude of the radius of an of a hydrogen atom without getting to uh, involved into calculations so also here we would need to uh, be able to say what quantities are relevant for this system so any ideas 
what is important here? This, this is a system consisting of proton and electron. What quantities may be important in, uh, in, in this system? Uh, meters uh, coulomb. Uh, okay, these are units. Like okay, these are units. Will okay. So maybe let's maybe let's move on. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, great. Charge of proton, charge of electron, mass of electron, speed of electron. That's great. Yeah. So let's uh, let's combine both these answers. So uh, at first uh, we know that electric motion is in uh is here in in progress like electric sorry we know that electric force uh, is working here and the electric force the strength of electric force is given by a uh, coulomb constant it is this coulomb law that the, the strength between two bodies with uh, two different charges is the uh, product of these charges over uh, square of distance and times k so we probably need this k. We also need the mass of electron, that's true, but we can guess that probably mass of the proton is not so important because it's electron, which is orbiting a very heavy proton, like much heavier than electron. So maybe the only important thing is the mass of the electron. And also, of course, we need the um, charge of the electron. Yeah, QE, that's true. And then someone, uh, Atticus, wrote about the speed of electron. That's great. We would probably need also the speed of electron. But the problem is that we have no idea what the speed of electron is. Like, we more or less know what is the mass of electron. You can find it easily using any tables of, of physical constants, similarly for the charge and for the K. But we won't find velocity of electron in a hydrogen, hydrogen atom uh, so simply. So we would like to have something other. And we can recall that there is something which is called quantum mechanics. And even though we don't know anything about it, like too much about quantum mechanics, we may know that there is some quantity very important in this field, which is called Planck's constant or Dirac constant or H bar. And one can find this, this quantity that it has the following uh, the following units. And one can say that, okay, if this system is small, it's quantum, it probably has something to do with this quantum constant. So let's put it also into our box of important, uh, important units. Uh, so not units, but quantities. Uh, and we can see that we have four different units, kilogram, uh, coulomb, meter, and second. And we have four different quantities, mass, charge, uh, Coulomb constant, and H bar. And uh, it, it is possible to combine them in such a way that we will get meter, something that is in meters in the end. And in fact, this combination is something uh, that gives us meters. And we can now calculate it. And we could just calculate it using calculators, but it's a very simple estimation. One can find that this H bar using just the, the tables that it is uh, 10 to the minus uh, 4, uh, 5, 34. Uh, K is in SI units 9 times 10 to the 9th, but let's just approximate it as uh, 10 to the 10th. And in a similar way, we can approximate the mass of the electron in kilograms and the uh, sorry and the <laughs> and the uh, charge of the electron. And then we have very simple things here because there are only uh, powers of ten, so it can be calculated even in head, giving us in the end ten to the minus ten meters. And if we check it with uh, the real value. Uh, it is one half of this, of this, uh, uh, of this result. So uh, the, the order of magnitude is very good. Okay. So to sum it up, the dimensional analysis allows one to find an approximate answer with little knowledge of the physical mechanism. In both these cases, we are just using a hunch of what is important and what is not. And that's the problem because it requires this intuition, which quantities in the problem are important and which are not. But 
if one has this intuition, it usually lets us get very nice approximated uh, result. And the last part I would like to talk very briefly regards the scalings. So imagine two cubes, one with edge of the length one meter and the other uh, with the edge of the length two meters. And obviously when we take one face of this cube, then the area of the smaller one will be one meter squared while the larger one will be four meters squared. And the volumes of them also uh, are correspondingly one meter cube and eight meters cube. Uh, so as length, uh, when we are scaling this object, as length uh, gets two, twice as large, the areas get four times larger and the volumes are getting eight times larger. This is very obvious observation, of course, but it's surprisingly uh, nice to have this observation because it leads to very interesting conclusions. So as an example, uh, we can uh, consider the mythical giants and see how uh, would they look in, compar in comparison with humans. So let us say that we have uh, an average human uh, and they have 1.80 meters of the, the height. Uh, and let us say that the giant we are considering is twice as large. Then uh, mass of the average human, let us say it's 80 kilograms. But the mass of the giant, since he's twice as large, mass, this mass will be eight times larger. But then, uh, let us say that the human has a strength that lets him, uh, lets him um, lift 100 kilograms in some way. Uh, and the question is, uh, what does this lift uh, depend on? For sure, it depends on the strength of the bones because uh, without it, like if, if bones are not str strong enough, the, the person would just collapse. Uh, it means, but okay, uh, but how does this, this strength scale? So for sure, mass of the bones uh, scale uh, with the third power. So it's eight times larger, but on the other hand, the strength of these bones uh, scales not with the volume, but with the area, because uh, it's, the important thing is the uh, cross-sectional area of the bone. If you just uh, take a cut for the bone uh, in the perp perpendicular direction, the area of this cut is the important thing. And the similar thing is uh, regards the muscles. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the most important uh, quantity relating to the uh, strength uh, from the coming from the muscles is not the muscle mass, but the area of this cross section of the muscle. So it means that uh, the strength in total scales not as a third power, but only as a second power. So in fact, humans uh, human is uh, in comparison with themselves um, stronger than such a giant. And it also uh, relates to the very well-known uh, trivia uh, that if uh, ant uh, that ant is very strong because it can uh, lift a single leaf, and if ant was rescaled to the size of a man, uh, then uh, it would be uh, they would be able to uh, lift a whole house. Of course, it looks like it doesn't uh, work like this because uh, the, the, the strength doesn't scale as simple as this, this trivia tells us. In fact, probably uh, an ant scaled to the human scale probably would just collapse ant under its own uh, weight. But there are also other problems, like for example, the blood volume. Uh, average person has uh, five liters of blood, so this giant would have eight times more than 40 liters of blood but this blood needs to have oxygen in it and oxygen is uh, brought by lungs and the area of lungs is very important thing and of course and again area of lungs scales uh, quadratically and not uh, like a fat power so it means that uh, that in in uh, effectively uh, this giant would have smaller area uh, of lungs by a um, by, an, by, by a factor of two. Uh, so it would mean that effectively he, he would live just with one lung. Uh, of course, it's possible, but then uh, with such a smaller area of lungs and also with such a smaller 
uh, effective strength. Uh, we wouldn't say that they were very uh, like uh, in in various mythical uh, stories that they would be so abominable and very strong and very uh, very agile. Uh, okay, I think that I'll skip this part and because we are yeah uh, to do the uh, to this the end of the section. So uh, the important thing here is that many physical quantities scale easily with the size of the objects. And sometimes these scalings are simple, like of course, lengths scale linearly, areas like square uh, volumes and masses with the third power, but also some more uh, involved quantities uh, scale in similar ways. Like we have said, the strength of the person scales with uh, like an area, so with the second power. But for example, moment of inertia scales with the fifth power. So it leads to many interesting and difficult uh, problems when one would like to rescale some things like, for example, uh, chopper, uh, sorry, like uh, plane or something, no, maybe not plane, uh, helicopter, sorry, helicopter, uh, okay. And uh, I think that it's time to uh, slowly end. And as a summary, I would like to present you uh, an idea for a very short research project that would involve many of these uh, things we, are talk we have talked about. And just to try to understand the, sol uh, the, the answer for a very simple question, why does an ant survive a fall from a roof and for a man such a jump is deadly? Of course, I'm talking about the roof of sufficiently high building. Uh, and in particular, uh, one can ask what forces act on a falling object. And of course, one of such forces is the force of gravity, but there is also the force of a resistance. And uh, while we all know what is the formula for the force of gravity, the formula for the force of air resistance not necessarily uh, is known by everyone. So the idea here would be to try to use dimensional analysis to see uh, what is the correct formula more or less for the res resistance and then to uh, try to understand how uh, does uh, the, the velocity, uh, the, the maximum velocity of the fall depend on uh, the parameters of the falling body, such as its size, and how does it scale? And what is, for example, this terminal maximal velocity for human and for ant? So that's just the idea uh, you could uh, work on if you had time and will. So that's all for me regarding this lecture, and thank you very much for your attention. Um. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip, uh, for this enjoyable uh, presentation. Um, maybe, you know, shake yourselves out uh, and you, Philip, as well. Uh, can you close your screen, please? Yes, yes, yes of course. So we have uh, uh, some time to hang out with our uh, speaker. Uh, so if you have uh, any questions you'd like to ask uh, following up, on the presentation itself, um, or anything you'd like to ask Philip about life as a physicist turned mathematician. Is that fair to say, Philip? Are you... I, I should hope it is or it will. <laughs> <At least. laughs> so you are also undergoing a transformation that's not exactly a symmetry. Uh, and will, that will hopefully not result in collapse, uh, but uh, a very promising career. That would be my bet. Uh, David uh, has a question for you. David, will you turn your video on when you're asking the question, if you don't mind? Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, the diagrams can obviously simplify our summarizing. Uh, so it is identical to changing some uh, complex objects with uh, just variables. But uh, how should we deal with mm, multiplying objects? So it is not so obvious how to uh, transform them into diagrams. Multiplying objects. Or how uh, do you how do you do arithmetics with uh, with diagrams? Uh -huh. uh, well, there are, 
there are uh, for sure methods to do arithmetics with diagrams. For example, in um, the different cultures, uh, people are uh, using different ways of performing multiplication with visual aids by uh, drawing lines like the proper number of lines and then calculating how many crossings of these lines that are but uh, the idea is rather that uh, not everything is well represented by diagrams but sometimes these diagrams are very helpful for very uh, specific tasks but they are not something that can work everywhere every time uh, for every purpose so just some applications are better and some are not well suited for this type of approach. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Are some piles a visualization of a general object? Uh, uh, it's, it uh, reminds me a very nice uh, school on gravity uh, by Friedrich uh, Schiller, as far as I remember, where uh, he was introducing the ideas of sets with additional structures building up to the things uh, needed for general relativity. And he started by uh, exactly using a sand pile as a visualization of set with absolutely no structure. And uh, so it's a nice visualization of a general object. That's true. <laughs> Uh, let me add that this would never happen at a math conference. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, there is a mathematics of sand piles uh, in stochastics. And I, I guess these mathematicians are having more fun than us. <laughs> I guess also they are dealing with much more complicated things, in fact, than many, many other fields of mathematics, because then they let on. sounds very difficult. Well, it's not all fun and play yeah, <laughs> with sand pile diagrams. Sophia has a question. Yeah, I would love to ask a question. It's not related to the physics uh, directly, but uh, could you please describe your uh, way of uh, education, how you um, dis discover your passion about physics? Because we are most around your age, uh, around the age when we have to decide uh, our passion in life, the way in life, and maybe how did you do that to, uh, because you're such a successful person? <laughs> Uh, sure. So, uh, well, I, I was interested in science uh, for most of my in science for most of my childhood, and I also am coming from a family of teachers of physics. So it was a pretty obvious choice for me. Uh, but then during my studies, I have found that in fact mathematics. Well, okay, I started studies of in physics, uh, in theoretical physics, but then I have. Uh, understood that mathematics is something that, uh, in fact, is more interesting for me, just, uh, you know, just by uh, attending courses in physics, in, in mathematics, in comparing what is more interesting for me and what is less. And then I have found out that even though I, I was planning to get a PhD in theoretical physics, I would rather do something more connected in, to mathematics. And now I'm trying to, to change <laughs> uh, even more to mathematics. But uh, the thing is that uh, I, I find that if you are interested in science in general and you do not know really well uh, whether it's physics or mathematics or even chemistry or uh, astronomy, uh, it doesn't really matter in the beginning because uh, many of these things use very similar ideas and methods. Uh, so any direction you will go, uh, I think will be good in the beginning and then person can pretty easily shift after, for example, undergraduate studies to a direction they found uh, more interesting for them at this very, at this very moment. Uh, and the second thing I think is very important in, in studies is to have a good mentor. Uh, if you are interested in uh, eventually becoming a scientist, uh, it is good to have a person who is able to introduce you into academic worlds 
uh, at the very beginning in the, in the, uh, during the undergraduate studies uh, because uh, then it's much simpler and it is possible to start building a very nice CV very early uh, but it may be difficult to find such a person and even more difficult it may be uh, to find such a person in a field that seems interesting to you and but i would argue that it's more important to have such a person than to to uh, to uh, go into direction that seems interesting for you at that moment because since you do not know too much about the, the academic world yet it may turn out that something that looked interesting at the very moment uh, doesn't is doesn't is, sorry isn't interesting in the end uh, so yeah <laughs> i i hope this this uh, pretty chaotic <laughs> hints would help <laughs> it's, it's not so chaotic may i just add philip um you you started uh, uh research very early on uh, yeah. in your in your studies and in fact i think by the time you finished your bachelor degrees you had a uh, you had papers already in several uh, directions. Uh, how did that happen? So how did you find your first mentor? Uh, and, uh, so uh, the, the, the uh, Jagiellonian University where I was studying has a program where uh, students uh, have some more individual approach and each student gets, his, gets their mentor. And uh, I had very, I was very lucky with my mentor that, that he, int he introduced me, me to, to, to this whole world. But then uh, I started also looking for something else after the first year. So it started another collaborations uh, because I, I wasn't sure that the thing I was doing is the most interesting thing that is possible. So I started looking into other directions. And it turned out that the other directions are less interesting, but still, it uh, <laughs> it uh, like uh, it gave me opportunity to work with new people on new projects and learn a new, totally unrelated things. Uh, so it was very nice interdisciplinary experience. But uh, I think that the most important uh, like lesson here is to be active, uh, like. Uh, for sure, it's good to go to the uh, professors and the uh, people that you are having tutorials with and other academics and talk to them, talk with them during the uh, open hours and just uh, because from my experience, they often uh, are alone, like people do not uh, go to them to, to talk during these office hours. And uh, it is a great opportunity to learn uh, both the subjects they are uh, they are uh, lecturing, but also just learn some lessons regarding how the academia works, uh, about some opportunities for some uh, collaborations, for some uh, scholarships and stuff like this. So it's good just to, to uh, be active in this direction and to, to uh, talk with uh, the, the, the staff of the academia. <laughs> Thank you. Ivana. Ivana, uh, would you turn your video on? Uh, sorry, uh, is it necessary? No, it's not. Uh, it's okay. okay. Uh, uh, do you mind if I ask you two questions? Sure. Um, uh, the first question is, uh, do you uh, you uh, you have said that uh, someone who uh, starts their education in science, uh, in any science, uh, they can switch then to other field if they feel uh, they are more interested in uh, that field. Uh, but uh, do you think that uh, there is a more general science, for example, physics? Uh, because uh, if someone studies biology, uh, maybe it would be way harder to switch uh, to a more mathematic maths heavy subject after after biology uh, yeah it may be true but of course they are uh, very, uh, there is very big field of biomathematics which takes uh, knowledge from both these fields uh, in a so in a way uh, maybe there are some fields more general than the, than others but uh, i think that 
if we are talking about the level of undergraduate studies, uh, there is no uh, such a large gap in between. Of course, it depends on the university and stuff like this, but I don't think it's a, such a large gap that would block you entirely from changing to some other discipline. Uh, so I guess if someone uh, was uh, like studying biology and then found out that something connected to biophysics or biomathematics uh, is very interesting for them, uh, then this knowledge from biology would be useful and then they could also learn some new stuff from this corresponding physics or mathematics and work in this field very well. Okay. Of course, it would be okay. difficult to, yeah. to, to, to jump entirely from, I don't know, astrophysics to biology. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that may be true. <laughs> yeah. uh, and what uh, may be what advice would you give to a person who wants to switch their course? Uh, maybe talk to someone or go to lectures. Uh, well, it's it's difficult because it depends on the university uh, and the, 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 the current situation because uh, like going for the lectures is always a good idea if, I, if even without being enrolled you can always go for some lecture if it's allowed I don't know how it's in different countries but in Poland it was allowed uh, to, to see just other lectures without any uh, any exams or something like this and learn in this more laid-back manner many interesting stuff and also uh regarding switching uh switching disciplines of course i guess one needs some uh some uh, like uh, approvals from the, the uh, dean or someone like this I, I can't answer this question in a bigger detail i'm sorry so like, my advice in this direction is is also sit in on on lectures from other disciplines. Uh, most faculties they have colloquia, uh, so those are uh, general talks, talks for a general scientific audience. Or uh, so maybe it's also important when we talk about mathematics or physics. Mathematics consists of very very many subfields, right? When um, um, when people talk about the Olympic Games, um, like the, the sporting event, right? There, there are many different disciplines, and, and mathematics is 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 very similar. Uh, and you, uh, like, when you're a professional mathematician, you wouldn't you wouldn't assume that someone who is super super good at geometry is necessarily also very good at counting. Um, I would be such an example. I'm terrible at counting things, uh, but I, I do pretty well. Uh, with with geometry and differential equations, so it's important to to explore that. And there's, it is very important. This is a personal journey. Nobody can tell you. Uh, so it's clear. All of you, you bring a lot of excitement. You bring passion, and clearly you are talented. But uh, don't let other people tell you what uh, the way to to go is. Uh, I think it's a really good idea, as Philip suggests, to find people, to find uh, advisors and, and mentees uh, who you uh, respect uh, and where you feel that you are learning uh, a lot uh, by, by getting close to them. But stay open to the possibility that, um, uh, you know, you will learn and expand a lot by by, by um, um, uh, being around such people, but stay open to the possibility that there might be something even greater and uh, even a better fit uh, to, to who you are. But you have time for that, right? Uh, even people who, so, you know, all of you or most of you are in high school still, um, you are, um, uh, you know, in somehow the, the usual, so I, I was quite young when I got my PhD, um, but, uh, uh, you know, it also took eight years uh, from the beginning of my, my bachelor studies uh, to my graduation with a PhD. And then, you know, later on, when you are a postdoc, such as Philip, uh, still, you are, you're not, um, um, you're not on your final track. You can still explore and change directions somewhat, stay open, um, 
uh, stay open and and uh, you know people will you know sometimes when you're very good at something people keep telling you of course you're going to be a mathematician but maybe maybe there is something uh, always stay open to the possibility that there might be something else that makes you at least as happy and that you're at least as good at uh, and it's a that's a good reason to to explore right and, and there is time for that and there's understanding for that because when you're talking to professional uh, scientists they will know exactly uh, what you mean there's hardly anyone I know uh, who's who's you know focused uh, straight away uh, when they, they entered college on the type of research uh, uh, they are doing now in their professional careers. Ivan. Uh, hi, Philip. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to ask you um, what work are you doing now? Like what uh, researches or uh, like you know what studies are you doing now, and what are you plan uh, what are you planning to do like in the next probably future? Okay. So right now I'm working on three projects. Like my main project is uh, coming from general is connected with general relativity, and uh, it is uh, looking for solutions. Uh, well, I will say it out loud in a complicated manner just once, and then I will try to explain what does it mean. Uh, looking for the solutions of uh Einstein and other related equations that are periodic in time and in fact it means that we are just looking for the space times that in some way are let's say pulsating in and are solutions of some equations and uh, that's the main project I'm working and that's the thing I'm uh, like employed in, in as a postdoc in at the University of Vienna uh, the other more uh, physically inclined things that I'm working on that one project in uh, in which we are investigating the quasi normal uh, oscillations of some in some space times and uh, what it, does it mean is uh, when you have seen uh, probably uh, animations from two gravitational holes colliding and they were uh, giving like some kind of spirals uh, usually in this visualization, these spirals have some uh, properties, like they have some uh, um, periodicity and similar things, characteristics, and we are uh, investigating uh, similar stuff in some models. And the most uh, physical project I'm working on is uh, looking into uh, beyond standard model uh, interaction, uh, by which I mean that probably you know that uh, currently people know that there are five types, uh, sorry, four types of interactions, gravitational, electromagnetic, weak, and strong, but nothing excludes uh, the possibility of existing other types of interactions and what I'm doing with a group uh, from the University of Mainz is uh, using very precise measurement uh, regarding atomic systems, simple atomic systems such as hydrogen atom and we are looking into, uh, into uh, results regarding the systems to find if they give us some uh, hints about some additional interactions that we have not seen yet as people. <laughs> so these are main directions I'm working on right now. Do we have any, any more questions? Uh, Daniel. Yeah, I would uh, ask you two questions if I could. Uh, did you uh, like? Uh, did you self learn a lot? And uh, could you give uh, some advice about self learning? Maybe self learning math or some self learning physics, as all of us are, you know, scholars, scholars uh, learn studying in school and uh, mostly studying math and physics by ourselves. 
Ah, oh, it's a great problem. Yeah, I've be I've done lots of self learning in my life, but uh, you not always with a good uh, result. <laughs> so I'm wondering what kind of good advice I can give. Well, the problem is that I think that eventually one, uh, even when one has a very good book or a very good. Uh, uh, set of problems with uh, uh, with explanations with uh, um, solutions. Uh, one usually encounters moments where it would be good to talk to someone else uh, about the given uh, given material. And usually, if this is a lecture, it's simple because you can ask the lecturer. Uh, but then if you are self-learning, that's a problem. Uh, so it's good to use things like uh, Stack Exchange and other similar platforms. But I think that the best advice I could give on self-learning is to not do it alone, but to find someone else who has a similar a goal, like would like to, to learn similar stuff and to do it together, because then you can Sometimes you would be thinking about something for the uh, long hours and couldn't find out what's this. You couldn't understand, for example, some passage from the book. But if you confront it with some other person, it's much, even if this person isn't a specialist, but it's just like you, it's also learning this thing right now. It's much simpler to just make a brainstorm and to understand it from because there are two perspectives at least then. So I think, yeah, it, it's good to do it not alone, but with someone. I would also like to add something to this. Uh, so we've already talked about the importance of good mentors, but maybe just as important as good mentors is to find books that speak to you. Um, so uh, I know this, get, this is getting a little bit uh, lost now that we... We, we, we think that we can access everything through the internet, but there's a lot uh, of, of really excellent uh, old literature. So I find that books that were written maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago about mathematics, uh, they were written with much more care. And some of the books were written to take the role of a mentor in, in many ways. And uh, uh, so when I was entering university, uh, the very best thing that happened to me. Uh, so I first thought that the general uh, library uh, of the university, the, uh, where they kept all the residual works at the end of the day, that they was it. I thought that's the universe of knowledge and the one shelf of books on mathematics that they had, uh, that's it. And I thought to myself that I was going to read from, you know, the first page of the first book to the last page of the last book there, and then I would be a mathematician. Um, and actually that was pretty depressing because there were really bad books. Uh, and uh, the best thing that happened to me is to ask uh, my analysis professor for, uh, for reading. Actually, I was asking him for additional problems. I wanted more of his problems to work on. And uh, he took me uh, to the real math library. And I was so excited. <laughs> so, and I don't know, I, I must have spent maybe 60% of my, my life during these years in that library. I was usually by myself, I, I will admit. So sometimes I would just lie down between the shelves and marvel at all the books. And um, so the, the professor, he also gave me some very good advice on where to start reading. And um, so I followed, I followed that advice uh, and it was really important to me. Maybe uh, I, I, I can ask you, uh, Philip, and also the other lecturers uh, in, our, in our series, what is your favorite book? What is your favorite science book? Mm -hmm. I see. Uh... I I have to think about it for five minutes, so maybe. I, but I see that there is a, there's a, a question. <laughs> there's another question, but we'll get back to so your favorite. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think about it for a moment. Anastasia. Yeah. Uh, yes. I would like to ask: uh, Could you recommend any open online sources uh, with something maybe interesting about physics or mathematics? Maybe YouTube channel or some sites. 
like yeah. continuing the topic of South Italian. So, uh, sure, sure. There are nice, of course, there are nice uh, channels uh, on YouTube, uh, which are presenting like sometimes recreational math, but not always. Like uh, I guess free blue one brown is pretty popular, but uh, and th these are channels that are also nice because they often uh, are a nice uh, addition to normal lectures or books because they are presenting things in a more visual way, which is very important in mathematics often to understand some stuff, to, to see it uh, more visually, to, to, to get a better understanding rather than just formulas. And I have seen that professors on, uh, during lectures often do not emphasize it enough. And also the very nice open uh, lectures that you can find, for example, at the MIT uh, site, uh, great lectures by Professor Walter Levin on physics or uh, great lectures on the, the introductory uh, calculus and algebra. Uh, there. So there are lots and lots of good resources like this. Uh, also, I guess that yeah. platforms like Coursera and stuff, stuff like this could be helpful, but uh, to be honest, I don't have a very good uh, a good experience uh, with learning math using this kind of platforms. <laughs> so, but it, it depends on the person, I guess. Okay, I think I know what uh, book I find is a very good one, and it's a nonlinear dynamics by Steven Strogatz. Mm -hmm because it's a very, very nice book, which is written in such a way that is understandable for a high school student. I was able to prepare a very nice uh, project, uh, like research project using this book for several high school students uh, last year or something like this. And uh, it has lots and it doesn't, it isn't very deep mathematically, like very, like, lots of statements that uh, sorry, there are lots of statements that are not proven, but just stated. But on the other hand, it gives uh, a lot of applications and it's an incredible uh, foundation for the further uh, learning of uh, differential equations and uh, related um, fields. So I think it's a very nice book. Uh, to, to, to study, even if one doesn't know anything about differential equations, it's great. <laughs> it's excellent. And Stephen uh, Strogatz, he really addresses uh, people from across all, all sciences um, uh, in, in his text. So it's very low entry requirements and uh, in, it's really going very deep uh, into the subject matter. I posted I posted the full title uh, to the chat. Uh, it's pretty long, yeah. <laughs> but the books, it's really fun to read as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's it's not uh, dry. It's written with very nice language, with some trivia and stuff like this. It's great to read. <laughs> Lots of very good exercises. That's also important thing. Oh, I see that someone mentioned ICTP. Uh, yeah, uh, lectures from uh, in, its International Center of Theoretical Physics. These are very good lectures often, that's true. And they are both in mathematics and in physics. And yeah, that's true. I guess we are creating our own favorite lectures now. <laughs> Paul and Philip, you have made uh, the first step in this direction. Thank you very much again thank you. Uh, from all of it's us. And thank, I would like to thank the audience for being active during the, uh, the lecture. It was very nice to talk with you. Uh, so let me uh, uh, just announce uh, that there, there will be another lecture tomorrow by uh, someone who I'm, uh, I admire fervently. Uh, as, a, as a scientist, but uh, someone who I also like very much as a person. His name is Martin Heira. He is one of uh, uh, the most highly decorated mathematicians um, of all times, it's fair to say, because he's not only won the Fields Medal, but another major award uh, in mathematics that was only recently established. It's called the Breakthrough Prize. And uh, he's a really interesting person. He's uh, uh, yeah, a very cultured person.
He, uh, his father is a mathematician, so he studied physics. <laughs> Uh, but then he was drawn back uh, to mathematics and he has a penchant for music. Uh, so uh, uh, very happy to see you again uh, tomorrow and thank you for, for the pleasant two hours that we spent together. Nitro, how do you say uh, goodbye uh, in Ukrainian? Um, <clears throat> Exactly that <laughs> to everyone. Goodbye. Thank you for the lecture. Goodbye. Thank Thank you. You. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.